a great evening with you. So we're going to talk about post-pandemic opportunities and put the heart back in your community will become more clear as I move through our slideshow. First of all, I, I would ask you to hold any verbal comments until after this first portion, this first 25 or 30 minutes. But it's okay to tell us by chat to slow down. We know uh, we talk too fast sometimes. And we're sure happy to have live comments when we get back into the workshop portion where we're going to spend some time asking you to think more deeply about these questions. Ekomo mai. This just means welcome in Hawaiian. And the Big Island is five volcanoes. It's the furthest southeast of the Hawaiian island chain, what used to be called the Sandwich Islands. I can tell you that as uh, in the last eight years, as Heartfelt Associates, we've done quite a lot of training in Rwanda. This is a group of guides with the national parks that we train there. And, um, we also worked with NASA, our space agency, with early career scientists there. So we've had quite a bit of really interesting engagement with professionals during these years. Oddly, I spent my morning picking coffee. I, that has to sound strange, but uh, at this season of the year, we shouldn't even have red coffee on the trees. And the very strange weather patterns that we're getting now with climate change, uh, I was out picking coffee. People come to this island because active volcanoes is pretty exciting tourism. And uh, you can't go out and see red lava right now, but two years ago we had a big eruption going on and a lot of ash landing on our farm and in our, we, we had a little cough each day that went with the air quality. The Volcanoes National Park is our biggest tourism attraction. Tim, our, sorry, Steve, just one moment, sorry, Tim. I need to interrupt. I got some instructions that I need to interrupt and remind people that there are two other workshops because some people may have missed uh, this, that they had to go to the other workshops as well. I'm very sorry for the interruption. Please go on. No worries. It's just fine. Um, we are in the Pacific Ocean, so spinner dolphins, we have our own subspecies of spinner dolphins and getting close to them in the water is not too difficult because they come up to take a good look at us when we swim. And it's one of the big attractions of the boating activities. Some of you may know that this is where Captain Cook lost his life. Uh, after his many years of exploring the world and mapping coastlines of Americas, he came to the big island of Hawaii and he had a broken mast on his ship and so he put into port to fix it. Some local people borrowed one of his boats. So he actually borrowed the chief of the local village and said, we'll give you back the chief if you give us back our boat. Well, his warriors took exception to that and took his life and he died at 52 years old. A uh, hundred years after his death in 1879, the United Kingdom built uh, a monument to Captain Cook here. And it's about a half, an half a mile, one kilometer from our house. So. Uh, the beautiful bay where he lost his life is one of our favorite swimming areas. Hawaii is unique. We're the most re remote islands in the world. And I tell you that because we're going to give some examples from all over the world. And uh, we're an interesting example right now with our 1.8 million residents, 10 million tourists a year. It's 20% of our economy. Three months ago, we had the lowest unemployment in the United States, 2.8%. Now it's 35%. And in hospitality and tourism, it's actually 51%. So there's literally tens of thousands of people in the Hawaiian Islands unemployed and maybe with not much of an opportunity to go back to work even during the summer. 80% of our food comes from the mainland U.S. or international uh, destinations. And so our food security issues are pretty big. Ships are not coming in the same quantity they were two months ago. Hawaii Tourism Authority usually only talks about money, how much revenue, and how many heads and beds. They actually now are talking about the triple bottom line, which has us very excited. 
we think the pandemic has brought us not only danger and hardship and budget cuts and time alone, which is actually quite wonderful with the right people and I'm with the right person. Uh, but the challenge, if you've got your kids at home all day, every day, and they're usually in school, but it's brought us opportunities. Plato, I think, made the original quote about necessity is the mother of invention, but a, a politician named John Ashcroft said it's the father of cooperation. And we're seeing that right now in the United States at a level that I haven't seen in a while. And I'll give you an example of the last time I saw it in just a moment. Today, we're going to do a few more slides that share some examples that I hope will stimulate your thinking. And then we're going to ask the group questions and we're going to break you into four groups and ask you as working groups for 15 minutes to come up with some ideas to share with everybody that we hope will springboard all of us into some new ways of thinking about uh, this. I would tell you that Lisa's book, Interpretive Planning, certainly put down her ideas in very concrete terms about how to do interpretive planning, but it made us think about communities and how often they compete. And our dogs are now attacking a mongoose that's in the yard. So uh, forgive the background noise. But it made us take a look at how do we apply these principles in communities. And we, we looked at 17 case studies in our book, and I'm going to share just a very few of those with you. First of all, community has a lot of definitions, and I'm sure in your life you have different concepts of community. There's the people who live locally, but right now we're in a community of professionals talking online. There's the community of tourism uh, throughout the islands that's one of our communities we deal with. It's beyond location. It's who, who do we work with and who do we share common values with? Hopefully, uh, harmony in a community is the heartbeat of the community, that we find ways to work together in a thoughtful manner. We kind of like the idea that we talk about heart as being the emotional connection to the world. And so we chose H-E-A-R-T as a way to remember some of the important points related to planning in a community. First one, H, is for holistic. We think that collaboration uh, brings diverse stakeholders together at the community level, hopefully to design a better future than they would have working alone in those stovepipes that Lisa mentioned in our keynote. Engagement. I mean, and when we talk about interpretation, we're talking about how do we make emotional and intellectual connections with people. We're not just interested in informing them of things. We want them to care a bit. And so those universals like love, survival, family, life, death, hope, uh, faith, they help people make those connections because those we share amongst humans throughout the world. Social marketing is the other one. We view it as a stair-step process. I mean, there's the person at the bottom that got dragged along. They really didn't want to go on the tour. They didn't want to visit the place. The spouse who's pressured into experiences, the child who would rather be somewhere else playing video games. And of course, we bring people along, hopefully, to awareness and understanding, and eventually to care about and to care for. Interestingly, in US research on this, 40 years ago, Americans, uh, fewer than 10% said they were environmentalists. Now, 90% say they are environmentalists. Or, um, but in reality, only 30% actually do anything that shows they care for the environment. Recycle at home, buy a house that's energy efficient, buy a car that's carbon efficient. And so uh, you might know the book, interpreting our heritage, Tilden in 57 put this in his book and he borrowed it from a National Park Service uh, operations manual. Through interpretation, understanding, through understanding, appreciation. 
through appreciation protection. We think that's what this social marketing construct is. It's us using effective communication and experiences to move people along. Certainly not in one interpretive experience does someone jump from dragged along. Um, we just lost the screen sharing. Do you still see me and hear me, Dahlia? I'm gonna to go to the share screen again, see what happened. Yes, yes, we can still see and hear you. So but the share screen disappeared? Uh, yes. Okay, uh, we're back? That's, yes, we are back then. Okay, great. Appropriate, um, I mean, we talk about knowing our audiences and planning for specific target markets, which we, when we design experiences, but do we design them collaboratively with a community or are they, again, the invention of our single organization? And should, are they appropriate to local core values? We're really aware we have a billion dollar 30 meter telescope project about to happen in, in the islands, but native Hawaiians are demonstrating against it and don't want it to happen. They feel it's a violation of their values. Hawaii Forest and Trail is very active in the American interpretive community, and they use uh, Hawaiian words to express our core values. That uh, aloha is more than just courtesy, it's about love, it's about respect for others and for uh, being generous of spirit. Re Kuleana is responsibility. Malama Aina, take care of the land. These values we're finding in our community aren't just something you put on a poster. Our neighbors talk about these words as if they're sacred, and yet they feel like they're not checked in with when tourism changes in the islands. And uh, we refer to elders as kapuna and they're supposed to be respected and asked for their advice uh, very often they're left behind in the islands so appropriate should be we should be thinking about not only our audience that arrives from somewhere else but those people who live locally and live with our traffic with the parking problems with the congestion in everything in our daily lives 30 years ago, I took a job that had me working with biosphere reserves and I learned about the triple bottom line. And I can tell you that I keep waiting for it to be important in America. It has not been. Profit is king. But interestingly, we're beginning to talk about how we have to communicate better with the local community. Public hearings can no longer be where a bunch of government workers show up and tell local people what's going to happen and why it's good for them. We may have to actually listen to what they think and factor that into what we create or what we change. And we have to be fair to people. We're talking about that right now because we're sitting with 30 million unemployed in the United States and that number is going to grow. The, our internet is so congested that they can't even get unemployment claims filed properly. There was just a meeting again through Zoom uh, amongst islands from all over the world and people from the Galapagos and Curaçao uh, spoke and from the Hawaiian Islands and they were talking about the community of the world's islands. We're all facing similar problems with global climate change with the pandemic with the challenge of over tourism, too many cruise boats, too many people, low quality experiences that damage the environment and that offend the local community. Finally, I'm hoping that we transform our interest in this from being academic to being real and putting it on the ground. I'm gonna show you some examples. First of all, we think that being thematic means that we know what the central idea is behind our tourism programming in a community. Our heritage has specific ideas that permeate it and that we share those in the way we present them. 
they serve as an advanced organizer to help people know. I was amazed when I was in Singapore that they had great interpretive signs on the street. As I look at them, I go, too much text, not easily read, but at least they're telling their story of Singapore on the streets. And I had some access to it as a, a visitor for a very short period of time. I want to take you to Hangzhou, China first. We were invited there about a dozen years ago to speak at a conference. It's right south of Shanghai. It was the capital of the Song Dynasty of China, one of the seven capitals of China. And I was amazed at what a learning community it is. Um, they actually state their theme right up front in the conference we were at. Water and people in balance create a harmonious union with the environment. They went on to give three sub-themes. The water scenery from rivers, lakes, and the sea all integrate to make Hangzhou special. And that their prosperity for the last thousand years has been due to water. And that water quality still matters. They were holding uh, either the first or second of their international conference on knowledge, science, engineering, and management. Now, here's the, the interesting thing to me. They bring experts from all over the world each year and have these seminars for three or four days. And they're doing two things. They're just paying for air flights and food and lodging for some of the top experts in the world to give them advice. Secondly, they're informing these people of what a great place Hangzhou is. And here I am 12 years later talking about it to you. Lisa was on stage speaking about interpretation of water scenery. We had World Heritage Site managers, we had local park managers, museum directors, uh, experts from all different aspects of heritage talking about water scenery. They took us on a boat ride on uh, West Lake, their beautiful lake that uh, lies right against this large urban area. They took us out to Shishi National Wetland Park, which showcases how fishing villages made a living also from uh, silkworms and, make, and weaving silk and uh, now doing silk art. They took us around in very traditional boats and conveyances to have the experience in the marshes and wetlands. We ate at a wonderful restaurant called the Lotus that was over a, overlooking a lotus bay and serving lotus, one of the fine foods in their very diverse menu. They took us to a historic home that had a beautiful koi pond in the background of it. And this is their sewage treatment plant outlet. We walked around on the boardwalks just enjoying the water lilies. And then they took us inside to show us that they put the affluent from their sewage treatment back into the local water so clean that he very comfortably picked up his Erlenmeyer flask and, and drained it, drank it, and said, I'm proud of how clean our water is that yeah. we put back. Tea villages surround uh, Hangzhou, and people go there to play mahjong and drink green tea, and it's surrounded by terrace tea fields, so you get a real sense of you're in a special place. And then when we went to the Hangzhou National Tea Museum for China, the director told us, uh, we asked why there was a stream flowing through the building, through the museum. He says, because uh, without water, there is no tea. The stories are intertwined and it all fit together. We left with a very great impression of this community but each year they're learning about a new subject related to science, technology, interpretation, communication. 1980, I moved from Illinois to Pueblo, Colorado in the, kind of the middle of the mountainous West. And when I got there, I was kind of shocked because my nature center was on the Arkansas River, beautiful, beautiful fast flowing stream out of the mountains, 100,000 people in the community, but they used the river as a dumping ground for car bodies, tires, refrigerators, and stoves. There were no fish. You, there was no scenic access because roads didn't take you down to the river. 
it was very disconnected and there was a lot of homeless people kind of living in little encampments along the river. Unemployment was 24%. That's what unemployment is in the United States right now. This is 1980. We lost 10,000 jobs in one year. Steel mills that went from Bessemer process to Carbon Arc and were able to fire most of their people, 5,000. Pueblo Army Depot gave, got rid of 5,000. Our historic downtown, and you, you won't think of a 150-year-old town as historic since you live in <laughs> communities that are hundreds or thousands of years old, but for the United States and the West, it's old. And if you watch cowboy movies, this is where gunfights occurred and rustlers were hanged downtown from the cottonwood tree. Uh, but the historic downtown had turned into used clothing stores, were really blighted. Deep economic recession. Steel mills had been Bessemer process for a hundred years, so they, they referred to Pueblo as Pew Town or Smelly Town. So our reputation was terrible, even though our air by 1980 was actually clean. And Arkansas was flood prone. Well, Southeast Water Conservancy was the local quasi-governmental group that had a lot of tax money and had enough insight into our crisis in the community to say, we can't solve this alone. So they call all these groups together. And we would go each month to a breakfast and say, where do we find money? What do we do with the money? How do we cooperate? We had no idea when we started on what we were going to do. Rules of engagement were share your ideas, talk about grant money, and then tell us what you're gonna to do to get it, and feel free to ask for some for your own organization. And that worked. Over a period of about 15 years, we brought in millions of dollars. I was the grants writer. County and city planning gave us landscape architects and uh, planners. The city parks gave us bulldozers and people on the ground. Southeast Water Conservancy District had deep pockets so they could spend money for matching funds. We couldn't have landed thousands of dollars working alone, but we landed millions working together. This 200, well, this, uh, let me do 70 meter fishing deck at my nature center uh, was built with that grant, part of that grant money, and you could catch trout from it. The Fish and Wildlife uh, group for our state started stocking the river with trout, and it became one of the best fishing areas in the western United States. So we changed the quality of the river. I had an annual river cleanup that over the first six years, we pulled car bodies, tires, and refrigerators out of the river. And after seven years, it literally, we were picking up cigarette butts and uh, aluminum tab tops off of cans because the rivers were clean. And we had united 26 miles of disjunct trails with grants money. And the downtown was beginning to get boutiques and sidewalk cafes instead of used clothing stores. And after we all made a group visit to San Antonio, Texas and saw their river walk, we realized there was an eight, well, three meter diameter tube of water under the streets that no one could see. And so we created the river walk and did this to the downtown. We took a vacant street and turned it into a waterway that you could take a restaurant boat and have a birthday party or a wedding or whatever out on this water and with a mountain backdrop in uh, Pueblo. Changed it forever. It's a dramatically different community with heritage at the centerpiece of its tourism these days. By the way, when I arrived there, the bumper stickers on everybody's car said, out of work and hungry, eat an environmentalist didn't feel very good as a nature center director. Greensburg, Kansas, by the way, is the middle of the country. And in uh, May 4th, 2007, a tornado wiped it out. And it had nothing going for it. The world's largest hand dug well and a 150 pound meteorite. This couple had moved back there. One of them grew up there 
from Denver. They had been urban planners and community development people. And they created the Association for Sustainability. They went to the city fathers and mothers and said, you're getting a lot of insurance money. Why don't you build back green and sustainable, not just build back what you had before? They now brag that they have more lead buildings per capita than any, anywhere in the world, lead uh, new schools, lead Platinum Hospital, and a green town visitor center. And they do tours for people from literally all over the world that come to see their unique little community. They call it Greensburg Greentown. Joplin, Missouri, about five years later, had a tornado wipe it out. And the same people went there and helped them. They energize shattered communities to think differently about the opportunities. Lead Platinum Architecture, this leadership in energy efficient design, is a hallmark of what they work with. They try to get buildings off the uh, carbon grid. They've worked all over the United States and in China and Japan in two locations in each country with their Association of Sustainability. All of this in 13 years. Twenty-five years ago, I heard a man from Curitiba, Brazil speak, and he talked about it being the eco city of Brazil, founded in 1693, now the greenest city on earth, because of this one man. He was a city planner, and he had innovative ideas, and he ran for mayor 12 days before the election and won the election. He was a Polish immigrant. He ended up becoming the governor of the province. He took the problems of urban sprawl and poor infrastructure and litter, and he gave people in the barrios groceries and transportation coupons for trash. Same thing with fishermen in the local bay. Instead of having gang problems as they have in Rio de Janeiro, uh, they apprentice uh, high school dropouts to city employees and give them apprenticeships that build into careers. He's won many awards for his creativity in this area, but he did one thing. He decided they should have pedestrian scaping in the downtown instead of the traffic jams. And so he told his crews, you have to do this between Friday night and Monday morning because the local merchants have a petition and they're going to stop us. So in three days, they pedestrian scaped their downtown. And the guy who started the petition came to them and said, keep the petition. We now see what it looks like. We want the whole downtown done this way. Change the way people behave. I was just hearing that some cities in Europe are doing more pedestrian scaping and they've used the cat catalyst of this pandemic to begin thinking about it. He created an above ground subway. It's not underground, so it's not a subway, but it works like a subway. He's won awards for the changes to this 400-year-old uh, community. I'm going to leave you with Seattle, Washington, the last three or four slides. They, in the 1990s, got interested in this and created a grade card for their community through collaborative planning. They said, we have to know what the metrics are for sustainability. What are we going to measure that changes? They, they identified on the left things that were headed down, that were declining in quality. On the right, things that were headed up, like air quality and water consumption. They identified things that were not changing, neutral sustainability. And then they admitted there were a lot of things they didn't have data for. So. That was a grade card for sustainability. I've not seen other communities do this, but think it was interesting. This is my last slide before we go to our group work. Just some observations. I think learning communities really stimulate ideas. I think Hangzhou, we met more people that were, that were lit up, that were thinking about the future in new ways. And it's interesting that anybody can be a catalyst for change. It could be a, 
a city planner, it could be a community developer, it could be an interpretive planner, it could be a guide. Pandemic is going to force us to re-energize heritage tourism and hopefully in a new way. I think we need to think about metrics. How do we know things change for the better? And collaboration can replace competition. This is a great time to bring people together and get them to innovate and think about what we do next. That's the end of my presentation portion of this. What we wanna do now is break you into four groups. Group one taking the first question, how do we reopen tourism and heritage communities safely and with a new sustainable commitment? Group two take, what are the metrics with which we'll measure success? Group three, who's gonna be the catalyst? Not the same approach as the past. Group four, how will we begin to make a change? How will the person who's gonna be the catalyst actually excite people enough to do something differently? Be like the couple in Kansas who went to City Fathers and said, you've got insurance money, use it more wisely, spend it better. By the way, one quote that I glossed over was uh, Jaime Lerner in Curitiba, Brazil said, um, if you want to be innovative, remove one zero from your budget. But if you want to be sustainable, remove two zeros. He was trying to make the point it's not about money.